I think architects are great at being at thinking laterally. We just have to utilize that part of our brain more. Business of Architecture UK, episode 35. Hello and welcome, Business of Architecture UKers. Fabulous to be back with another episode this week. I'm your host, Ryan Willard. And on this episode, I had the good fortune to speak with Reba Journal Rising Star of 2018, Tara Boladay, who is the co-founder of Studio Boladay. She is an incredible architect. She's a certified passive house designer. She has recently launched an app which helps architectural professionals pass their professional examinations called the My Part 3 app. She is part of the Reba Fluid Mentoring Scheme for Stephen Lawrence. She's an advocate for cultural and ethnic diversity and gender equality in the construction industry. And in this interview, she goes into a lot of depth about how she's set up her business, how she planned her exit strategy from her previous employment and how she's developed a business model with a three-pronged approach for creating multiple streams of income for her practice. So there's some real gold in this episode. So sit back, relax and enjoy Tara. Hello and welcome to the business of Architecture UK. I'm the host Ryan Willard and I'm, my privilege today is I'm talking with Tara Boladay. Thank you very much for having me. Pleasure, pleasure. Absolute, brilliant to be speaking with you. So tell me, how your, your studio's been going for about a year. You've yes. just been nominated. You've just won one of the, being one of the Reba Rising Stars. Yes, yes. So that's yes. quite an incredible accolade. It is, it is. It's been amazing. It's been an amazing first year and um, wasn't expected. Yeah. Um, but I was nominated and we went through um, a long list of 23 architects. Um, and there were, yeah, nine winners, including myself. So it's been brilliant. Congratulations. Thank you very that's much. Su that's super exciting. It is. It so is. it's a young practice. It is. How, how has it begun? Why did you start? What were you doing before? Um, so I was in, I was in practice RJMP um, before, which are based in Leicester and London. And I was in the Le London office. Um, and I was there for about five years. Uh, prior to that, I was in a small practice, DLK, um, outside in Reading. And prior to that, I was at Mace Group. Um, I think running practice oh, is something... Okay. You were working at Mace before. I was, yes, okay, so which was brilliant. Um, I think it gave me a real understanding um, of architecture in context. Yes. So with uh, QSs and structural engineers and all these other disciplines and contract management. Um, so it gave me a really good um, idea contextually of how architecture sat in construction. Mm. Um, and it also helped me make the decision that I wanted to do my part three in a really small practice. Right. Um, just so I could be on a steep learning curve because, you know, tag your it, <laughs> planning needs to get done um, and you have to do it. <laughs> so it was important for me to do my part three um, and start my professional practice experience in a really small practice, after which I moved into um, RGMP, which is more medium sized, multidisciplinary. Um, and that was a brilliant space to to work with and work in. And so the uh, the kind of projects you're working on now, you're doing a lot of uh, multi-residential projects, yes. private houses. So how have you gone about finding those clients? How did you how did you set up? How did you win those first bits of early work? Um, it's really interesting because um, I sort of made the decision that I was leaving practice. Um, and we didn't have a great number of projects um, lined up and ready to go and raring to go for the first year. But what I had done is save just in case anything <laughs> went wrong. I could at least feed myself for a year. Um, so when we started practice, it was... So this was, was something you were planning for a while then? It yeah. wasn't planning for a while, but it was... It was it's something that I had at the back of my mind that it was going to happen one day. Um, and then I realized, so at the, at the time I made the jump, I'd just been offered associate director. And I kind of thought, if I said yes, I'm going to be here for another five, ten years. And I thought, I'd rather spend my youth building something that I want to build mm. um, and do architecture my own way, if you like. Yeah. Um, and luckily, I'm just financially astute. <laughs> so, so I saved along the way. Um, and so when, when we started... Um, 
I think the first few projects actually was really good because it came from my previous practice. Um, not really expected, but I kind of said to one of my clients as I was sort of handing over and leaving, um, you know, I'm leaving, wish you the best. And he was kind of like, well, no, you can't. <laughs> <laughs> this project needs you. <laughs> I was like, really? <laughs> so that was quite good because uh, the next day I, called, I got a call from my uh, director and who um, asked me to become a consultant, um, which meant my prices went up quickly, <laughs> quickly which was excellent. Yes. Uh, so it was quite a nice, uh, a soft landing spot. Um, and because obviously I know the product and how I've worked with my previous practice before they needed some assistance with um, some other work. So that was quite nice. So actually the first few months um, happened quite nicely. Um, and then I got comfortable bad. Um, and I should know better because in practice I'd learned that um, the best time to market yourself or the first time to look for new work is when you're busy. No, when you're not. Yes. <laughs> so um, really the first few months should have been spent running around like finding new work. Um, but I got comfortable because <laughs> I thought, oh, I can see a good, you know, six months here, cash flow. This is, this is looking all right. Um, and it did work out that way. And then halfway through the year, I kind of thought, wait a minute. <laughs> I started looking forward again. I thought, wait a minute, I need to go out and find new work. Um, but luckily, um, so all kinds have been really um, supportive, shockingly so, actually. Because um, once they heard I was starting practice, you know, I literally got a call saying, right, we want to support you. What do you need? And it was quite... A remarkable start, I think. And it was great to see that build um, great relationships, which I think at the time I didn't realize I had. Mm. Yeah. And it was quite interesting. We were, we were talking just before this interview and you were, uh, you know, and you just mentioned there you were quite financially astute and you had the foresight to be able to save a little bit of money before. <laughs> I know many architects who haven't done that, yeah. <laughs> <me> included. <laughs> um, how important do you think is understanding money and finances and how, you know, where have you learnt about these kind of business elements and how important has it been in these early stages of running and starting a business? <laughs> Good question. Um, I think I've, I've learnt in my latter years, if you like, I, I read uh, one of the books that you've, you've also read, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, quite oh, a while yes. ago. And I think it's stuck in my mind that at some point I have to be a business owner um, or an entrepreneur, however however you want to move on. Michael, that book life. needs to be in university. It needs to be standard reading, like, not in university, in, in school, in primary yes, school. Yeah, yeah. No, totally. I think we need to have that mindset from, from yes. you know, a very young age because I think it's quite difficult because now you're learning a really important skill later on in life. So um, it's probably the first book that when I do have children, I'm going to <laughs> insist yeah. they read. Um, but I think that was at the back of my mind. Um, so can, so you, can you tell us a little bit about perhaps people who haven't read the book, mm. what the what the <laughs> profound shift was? Um, I think it made me understand the difference between an employee and a business owner or entrepreneur and the concept of, I think for me, what I got from, from the book was um, as an employee, you have one client, that's your employer. Right. As an entrepreneur, you have many clients or as a business owner, you have many clients. Um, and it and then it sort of made sense, well, if that one client one day can't pay, so as we know, Brexit or uh, recession, if that client can't pay and they let you go, what happens? And I kind of thought, well, I don't want to be, <laughs> I don't want to be sort of left out, you know, what's, happen what's happening. And so for me, it started making me think um, more broadly about how I could diversify my client base, mm. be it architecture, be it product, be it development. And that's actually how the thinking behind our practice has be begun, if, if you like. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, I think that's what I got from there. And I thought, I'm actually going to use the skills I already have, architecture, and how can I diversify that? Mm. And so how has that manifested in your business practice? In the business um, practice, when we started, we started with a very clear and strong business plan. Um, I know many architects don't start with a business plan, but we did. Um, and we identified we wanted to go down the architecture route. It's, it's a three-pronged uh, approach. So architecture, product, and development or develop, being developers. Um, now, they don't all have to move at the same pace all the time, but they're always all moving, all three we are moving so architecture suddenly is moving product we created an app which i'm happy to chat about um and developments understanding really where our client is coming from particularly the types of clients we work with and wants to eventually um, develop with um, understand how we can work better with them understand their pain points and how we can yeah make informed decisions in our design so is, is the development 
you doing projects where you retain some sort of equity in the final project itself or is it like servicing developers? It's servicing developers for now and in time it will grow. Into, okay, so it's, yeah. it's, it's with that you're using the kind of... Uh, learning equity, if you like. That's it. To exactly that. Brilliant. Exactly okay. that. Exactly that. Yes. Um, which which means that it, it just they all link to each other because it means that we learn very much with development in mind, which um, informs our architecture. Which means that when we're designing schemes, we're from the beginning understanding or trying to understand the commercial viability of them uh, to feed back into our developers, so they get a better product, they get a better service mm -hmm. because we're coming from a place of. Um, Understanding, really. Okay. Yeah. And so the architecture part of this three-pronged approach, what does mm -hmm. that entail? So we um, specialise in residential developments. Right. Um, and so that could be for public sector clients as well as private sector clients. So public sector, local authorities, housing associations, mm -hmm. and the private sector mainly for us SME developers. Um, we feel that they're the right type of scale for who we are and um, what I've done in my experience. In my experience today, I've worked with small, medium and large um, developers, private developers. Uh, I quite like the SME uh, market. They're, they're really good. I love their entrepreneurial thinking as well. And I learn so much um, from them, especially now in a way that might be more difficult for slightly larger clients. Right. Yeah. And then the product aspect of this, this is, so this is something kind of very innovative and mm that kind of moves away from what most architects will do in their businesses is, and even to begin to look at an alternative, uh, you know, stream of income. Yes. So what's, what's the product? So the product is um, an architecture app um, and it's the first of its type. It's a, it's a mobile device, it's a mobile application. Mm -hmm. So it's called My Part 3 app, which is available just on iOS at the moment and an Android version will be coming out soon because that's the only question we get asked. Um, Architects don't yeah. use Android at the phone. Right? I know. <laughs> I, I really am tempted to respond to anyone who asks, you really need to be on an iPhone. <laughs> but I don't. <laughs> Um, so yes, it, it's an um, architecture app that helps students navigate, or part threes really, navigate um, the transition between coming out of, from university and starting out in practice. Because as you know, and as most architects will know, um, when you come out of university, you realize that you're, you're quite devoid of what's going on in reality and how to build buildings and run mm -hmm. projects and run practice. Yep. And the app does exactly that. It gives that type of critical information as well as... Um, resources that expands the architect's mind or the young architect's mind really to approve documents or building regs what are those when you come out to a university what do you mean building regs um, or planning so quite practical um, information but that's really quickly accessible right and so what, how does it work as so um, as you open the app yeah. jump, jump online and find it it'll be easier but it's, it's called the part three app it's called my part three app my part three app okay. yes um, and as you open the app you've got two options uh, run a project or run a practice and when you're running a project you open it up and it's um, in line with the RIBA stages so it gives you very clearly um, quite quickly that actually when you're going to run a project this is this is the standard if you like that that we work to as architects um, you can you can sort of hit a push down button wig, which gives you a bit of, of an overview of what each stage does. And when you go into um, each section, say architects fees, it tells you that architects usually charge your, your clients on a percentage basis or time basis, um, does little calculations for you. You can um, sort of tag pieces of text and write your own notes mm -hmm. within it. Um, and then the second section, the second ma major section is run um, a practice, which um, gives you more business skills. Um, right. So HR, um, how much of time sheets, why they're important. I know as boring as they are, why they're important and, and how it relates to your cost, how it relates to your profits. Um, bids, frameworks, what's owes you. So those types of practical information that again, actually in practice as an architect, you might not necessarily have access to mm -hmm. um, because again, you're really focused on running project, but it's important to understand how practice runs as well. I think it, it makes you a better employee. It makes you better prepared for should you decide you want to start a practice? Um, yeah. And, and then so, finally, yeah. And so how did you come about with this idea? Where did this come from? Um, it's interesting. Actually, we were speaking to um, my co-founder and I were speaking to a friend who is a medic, um, a brain surgeon. <laughs> and he said, oh, I made this app for, um, for medics to pass their exams. So we thought, 
wait a minute, <laughs> that's a really good idea. And that was a few years ago. And we thought, well, actually, we, 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 we can do that. And we thought we've already got this architecture sk skills. Um, and we found that, you know, that navigation between university and um, reality, there was, there was a gap, if you like. And we thought, well, how do we plug that gap? And this is where the app came from. Um, and then we had the crazy of idea of um, wanting to code so learning to code and do the app ourselves, which is actually the reason, the main reason for why it's um, on iOS, because we both had Macs. Right. <laughs> I kind of thought, okay, well, we learn to code. So and you we, developed it yourself. You actually we started that. Okay. And then uh, reality hit. <laughs> yeah, okay. And then we thought, no, we need an expert, <laughs> an actual developer. And we brought, and we very wisely brought um, someone on. But we did. We started coding um, and it was very many late nights, long nights. And mm. it was good because um, it means that actually with the app right now, we can actually go into the back of it and we get an understanding of how it does work because we, we learned those skills. So we, and, we and started a new language. So how, so how does the app then, how does it support your business? How does it work alongside? Is it now, In, is it, does it generate an income for you? Mm -hmm. Does it in two ways, um, which is really clever and sort of developed. And I think this is where uh, uh, the entrepreneurial spirit of architects really comes through. So one way it does uh, generate income is through its end user, part three architects or young architects or architects generally. So people have to is, pay to get the app? People have to pay. Okay. It's uh, 199 at the moment, which okay. is really... Um, so so not, it's not, not going to break the bank. It's not going to break the bank, especially yeah. if you want to your part three. Yeah. <laughs> so that's, um, that's one. But then the second... Um, quite clever bit is that we've commercialized it. So we've um, we've partnered with um, people like Graphisoft and um, at the moment a couple of other uh, big companies, uh, UK companies, uh, which we'll wait for the ink to dry before we say further on that, yep. um, who have sponsored the app um, or want to advertise within the app. And actually that's been a really powerful way for us to generate income through through the app, so it's not actually through sales, which is through end, end user sales, but of course companies who want to grow their product, grow their offering, they now have a captive audience in perpetuity because yeah, every year you get a new set of architects who are specifying particular products. So it's been a that's been really amazing. Uh, yes, very, very very clever. And yes. and is there more of these kinds of digital products in the pipeline? There are, there are, and we've got um, the problem is that we've got too many ideas, and it's actually trying to choose <laughs> yeah. to choose and, and that's I think as architects we've, we've got so many ideas all the time um, so it's always trying to choose which ones we're going to run with over the next few months and so yeah we've got um, a couple that we know that we're going to bring out in the beginning of the year and again can you share any see. little teasers about them um, they're digital <laughs> <laughs> okay so yes they're digital um, and yeah they'll come out soon okay, so that's, what you're giving, that's what you're giving at the moment yes <laughs> okay so how so so that's really, really, really interesting. And how do you balance then your time between developing an app and launching it and promoting it and marketing it and also running your own business and finding new work and new clients? Um, at the moment, I'll be honest, there's not very much balance. <laughs> it's okay. you wake up with a mobile phone in your hand and you go to bed with a mobile phone in your hand. <laughs> um, but it's exciting. Yes. All of it is really exciting. I, you know, I do obviously try to balance life. We do obviously try to balance life. Um, but it is all exciting and they're all important. So we, um, I guess we prioritize, we try to prioritize what's going to have the biggest impact in terms of cash flow, in terms of um, marketing. Um, and then how do we... How do we take advantage of that? And for us, I feel this is why it's important for us to be diverse, not just architects who sort of wait for projects to land, mm -hmm. um, but architects, and this is why we thought about the development side as well, but architects who create work. So we actually, if we find a site, we'll go to a client, say, this is a site here, and this is what we think we can do. Um, so we're always looking at creating the work we do, not just waiting for work. And this is where the app comes in as well, because we're actively, suddenly everybody's a bit more interesting, because architects can sometimes um, focus on architecture and if, if someone if a manufacturer comes with a product you're like oh later 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 but everybody becomes far more interesting to us because we can actually have a conversation with everyone because there's opportunity for dialogue there's opportunity for well it's, 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 it's really interesting what you say about um, becoming the creator mm. of the work mm. and I think that also is an entrepreneurial drive mm. where rather than trying to wait for clients that you're like, well, actually, I've got something for sale. I'm going to figure it out. I'm going to find someone who's going to buy it or yeah. I've got an idea. Yeah. And I think architects naturally are very good 
at that. Like you yes. say, we've got lots of good ideas, yes. but rarely do you see the entrepreneurial spirit. So what do you think is, is, the, is the restriction or the constraint that many architects face um, around that? Why do you think... I think sometimes we can be quite siloed. Um, when architects particularly come into practice, yeah. um, you're, you're learning so much about your craft, you're learning so much about your trade. I think architects are, are very good and they want to be very good at this one thing. And sometimes it allows us to just focus on this one thing and we fail to look up and see what's happening up around us. And so I think the more collaborative we can become as architects, the more these ideas flow. Because I speak to so many great architects who've got phenomenal ideas mm. and I'm like I can't believe you thought why haven't you done anything about this um, and it's interesting actually we ha we recently had um, a publication um, in the architects journal about the app and I had quite a few architects come over and say oh I've thought about doing an app and you know it's a conversation I probably ordinarily wouldn't have had with architects and I thought well do it then you know it's, you know I, I feel do the thing have the power if mm. you have a great idea, just do it. Even if you don't think it's a great idea, just do it and you'll learn from it. So um, I think architects are great at being a thinking laterally. We just have to utilize that part of our brain more. So and we were talking earlier as well about uh, business systems. Mm. And I, I was, you know, it was quite refreshing to speak to an architect who puts that at the forefront. Can you tell us a little bit about the sorts of business systems you employ in your own practice and what business systemization means for you mm. and how you've developed it okay um we look at standardization a lot um and so in terms of business on a multitude of facets if you like so right from when we get an um an inquiry from a client depending on the type of work it is we've got standard feasibility documents if you like which includes viability appraisals so we look at the client's uh, numbers and we have it we can have again an open discussion but we strongly believe particularly with multi with housing with multi-unit developments we strongly believe in standardization one bed apartments two bed apartments three bed apartments they're the same and yes yeah, sometimes you can um you can make them slightly different but architects are obsessed with reinventing the wheel mm. which is incredibly inefficient um and so we take advantage of what we've got available to us one bed two bed three bed units multi-unit um <laughs> developments they're going to be the same um yes you're going to amend them according to context um what what i think is important for us is that as architects especially when it comes to feasibility or pre-app because of the time limits we always have we can spend 80 percent of our time working on the plans and then 20 percent of our time quickly rushing on elevation and getting out the door because we've got to meet a, meet a deadline. Um, we strongly believe that we have um, systems in place, standards in place. You can actually spend 20% of the time making sure your plan works because it does. Um, and then 80% on being real exciting architects. Now you're thinking about social value and now you're thinking about um, your context a bit more. Now you're thinking about your elevational study a little bit more. Um, so I think standardization allows architects to be far more creative in what we do. Um, as a standard, we also, we really quite bent on trying to be as efficient as possible. Mm. So um, I was saying earlier that we where we use BIM, BIM software, for example. Um, so all our projects, so, you know, it really doesn't matter what it is. Everything gets done in BIM. Um, I've heard the argument saying, oh, when it's a small domestic, it doesn't need it, or it only needs it when it comes to a certain size. We don't believe that. Again, because we've got standards and systems in place, it means that every piece of work we do can be quite efficient in how we approach that. We've got all, all our BIM standards, um, I think I think what I find fascinating is when um, when I speak to architects, but usually small smaller architects um, who have um, who work in two D, for example, um, and I think this is also where architects end up spending quite a lot of time doing work that they get to reinvent the wheel all mm. the time. So, you know, my argument is that if you're if you're in 2D, stop this podcast right now and go and buy a 3D product. And if you're not going to, um, or buy BIM, BIM um, products, and if you're not going to do that, because I understand the difficulty um, in, in switching that mindset from, oh, the, you have to learn something new and you have to learn something... Um, that requires, yeah, a lot of effort to put in. You either employ someone to do that, or you make that decision that you're going to do that. You're going to do that, um, or if you're going to work in TD in two D, then there needs to be systems again in place that you're not reinventing the wheel. You 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 are copying and pasting. And architects can get quite precious about the architecture and the arts and the design, which is all important. Yeah, well, it but was, it inefficient. Was, it, was, it was like what you were saying uh, earlier about like working to deadlines. Yes. 
when your client says, you and you say you're going to deliver this at 12 p.m. on Friday, yeah. it is there done by 12 p.m. on Friday. Yes. Yeah. A we- lot of architects, not that I've ever done this before, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> when, you have, when you have a deadline, yeah. or, or, or a lot of architects will be vague with mm-hmm. their deadlines, yeah. which is perpetually infuriating for clients. Yes. Yeah. It's like, it's actually in the business context, it's kind of unacceptable yeah. to not be able to give a clear structure. Yeah. But then there is this conflict of like, yeah, but it needs time. Yes. I need to be able to, you know, I need to create more things. I need to, how do you, where does that conflict come from? And how do you, how have you resolved it? Um, I think I was incredibly lucky when I was, um, when I was in practice to have an MD who was uh, strict on time. <laughs> So, like, like you say, when, when something needs to be delivered 1 p.m. or 12 p.m. Friday, it's delivered then. It's not a minute later or whatever. You stick to the deadline, end of. Um, and it's something we've carried into practice. So we're quite, we tell our clients exactly when we're going to deliver. And we, number one, um, how is it, over-promise, un- no, the other way around. Um, <laughs> exactly, not under-deliver. <laughs> we, we, um, under-promise, over-deliver. That's the one. Yes. <laughs> we yeah, yeah, under-promise, yeah. over-deliver. So if... If we know we're likely to get it by Tuesday, Wednesday, done, maybe, um, we'll tell our clients, you'll have it by Friday. Um, and then anything earlier is a bonus. Even if they get it Thursday night, it's a bonus. Um, so they're never disappointed. Yes. Yeah. Um, and number two, this is really where the systems come in place. So we don't waste time with design. We, um, well, not design, but we don't waste time with what can be done efficiently. Like I say, once you have a system in place, you're able to spend more time doing the architecture thing, doing the design thing, thinking about the commercial vi- um, viability of a scheme. It's important to, to do all that because we're architects, we're artists, but we are technical as well and we are logical as well. And it's important to engage both sides. We're not one or the other. That's, that's the importance and the uniqueness of being an architect, that we get to understand a broad landscape and bring that value quite quickly to a client. So we insist on putting deadlines. Yep. Um, it also stops us from spending three weeks designing um, when it can be done in one or two. So, yeah. and so what, what, what would you say are the most powerful systems that you have in place in your business and how do they work? Um, very good. <laughs> um, because a lot of our, our developments are multi-unit, yep. um, we've got standard one bed, two bed, three bed layouts, for example. Okay. Um, we've got single aspects, dual aspect, triple aspects. So when, it, when we have a site, uh, depending on context, it's almost like Lego. You know, we're, we're putting these together. We also have standards like these are our stair cools, uh, these are our, um, our fire uh, travel distances. They're already locked in. So it is, um, it is really Lego putting them together. Mm. Um, so you can usually get a feasibility particularly um, quite quickly, incredibly quickly. Um, because we've, we've unlocked, we've put the maths out, we've unlocked the value in what we do. And we've put put that together there, if you like, for a client. And um, yeah, th- th- those are that's that's one. Uh, two is our BIM standards. So we've got standard. Particular, if if say we're looking at domestic work, which we try not to do very much of, but if say we're looking at domestic work, um, and the client is likely to go down the uh, traditional route, we've got standard um, brick brick block. We're not repeating it over and over again. Yeah. We're just not. We've got standard windows that we use, which are great. Which You know, it's all the experience we've had over years that we've put together and then apply to very many projects because it's it's still all bespoke to that client. Yeah. So on on you know, unless you're having a client who um if if you have a repeat client, then okay, it might not be so bespoke. But because you're in a different site site context, it is still bespoke. So your your project innately is bespoke because of its location, because of the client. Um so there's no need for architects to reinvent that wheel yeah. all the time. And so, so these, are, these are all systems on the delivery side mm-hmm. of the business. What mm-hmm. kind of systems do you have in place on the marketing and sales side of your business for winning work? For winning work? Oh, yeah. Gosh, I, I, I wouldn't say, I don't know if it's system. It's more just what we do. <laughs> so right, okay. but perhaps it is system. But we do a, a lot of networking um, yeah. in terms of winning work. Social media. Um, social media has been amazing actually (laughs) that's a whole different story but social media has been amazing and actually particularly with the app um, some of our biggest um, biggest deals have come from social media has come from a like button which has been ridiculous (laughs) Uh, which has been amazing 
Um, so yeah, we've used social media heavily and we've done a lot of networking. Um, and I guess the existing contacts we already have, it's, it's just nice to be a nice person. What I have found surprising, um, which I, w- I certainly wasn't expecting, is that I thought I'd be only client facing, so only uh, local authorities or lo- only housing associations or only SME developers. But um, my our architectural networks have been incredibly powerful as well. This is where I strongly believe in the power of collaboration. Um, because architects have um, said, oh, actually, we can't do this. Can, can you look at it? And we've done the same. When a project comes in, if, it's, if we feel it's too small for us, we'll hand it over to a different architect. So I think actually as a, as a collective, as a as a group of architects, we're quite powerful and we're this able is, yeah, to... This is, yeah, this is really interesting. I think this is yeah. a bit of an... I mean, I've won some of my best projects from other architects. Yes. It's, it's madness. And, and it wasn't expected. I think that's the part that I find shocking. Yeah. <laughs> that, you know, I feel actually as architects, we're moving uh, away from competition towards collaboration. Mm. And if we're not, we really should be. Um, because, like I said, I feel like any... Um, any progress we have, other architects benefit from it in, oh, some, yeah. capa- in some way or form. Yeah, yeah, other yeah. architects benefit I, from it. I think it. that's one of the strengths of our profession is yeah. that as we promote architecture and archi- and being an architect, yes. and you know through our own individual efforts, that collective title yes. raises its value and is good for the entire industry. Absolutely, and also it, um, coming back to um, the concept of fees, which is which is again the perennial issue with, client, with uh, architects, is um, Again, when you have conversations with other architects, you know, for example, we, we do a 10% commencement fee. Um, I, I know architects who do 50%. I know architects who don't charge at all, which we cannot do. Um, but, but when you have these conversations, you realize, actually, no, we're all going to decide not um, to charge for because we're always bringing value. Immediately, we hit pen to paper that value added because mm. we're thinking and we've we've already thought about building regs, we've already thought about planning risk, we've already thought about construction risk and then we've put our pen to paper or mouse to cat, whatever. Um, there's, there's so much value that we that we don't understand. I think under, um, architects don't understand the power they have and the value that they bring to developments. And this is also why I strongly believe that architects need to be more commercially aware mm. um, because once you understand the value you're bringing to a client, once you understand... Um, say how many units need to be on a site for it to become valuable. You see the profit th- that they're making. You see the allocation that they've got for architects. We're always like, oh, how much? How much are we going to charge? <laughs> we, we do it every time with every project, um, and it's not that hard because actually, when you see a client's um, appraisal sheet, they've got they, a system in they've place. They've got a system in place. They've got a budget allocated for what for it architecture, is, so... for structural, for legals. It's all there. And once we have that, <laughs> Bob's your uncle. It, it, it really is not. Um, it's not rocket science, but it is something that is critical that we get into our education system. It's critical that we get into our part three system um, because it's, you know, you, you, I remember when I first saw an appraisal sheet, I thought, what? <laughs> I can't believe this has been here all along. Um, and more architects need to, be, need to be able to do that and, and rewarded for it. You know, I, I, I don't see why architects, especially when you employ um, other architects, why you shouldn't give them an award for bringing in a job. You know, and not just Mm. a a thousand pound bonus, but, you know, 10% of the fee or 20%, whatever it is, percentage of the fee you bring in goes to you. How's that for incentivizing? Immediately you get everybody. Imagine if you're working on a 40 man practice. Imagine a woman practice. (laughs) Imagine if you have everybody now, everybody's in marketing. If you empower everybody to market. You know? No, totally. Yeah, and, yeah, and also, that power is it starts amazing. to develop a good company culture. People exactly. are willing to talk about their work. Exactly. They want to, you know, there's, there's, there's more invested interest in it. Absolutely. So, so, what's been in the last year since setting up? What's been the biggest obstacle that you faced and how have you overcome it? Um, I don't know about overcome, but. <laughs> no, well, what, yeah, the... What, what's the biggest obstacle <laughs> that, you're, that you're dealing with and you're. The, the biggest obstacle, uh, and perhaps maybe a way of overcoming perhaps, but the biggest os- obstacle was probably not different from any other architects, finding new work. Um, and I guess, I guess that, that concept um, that I mentioned earlier about being comfortable mm-hmm. when we were doing quite well or started out quite well. Um, so it's, it's forgetting that you, you need to be on all the time, and that's fine. So, and this is where things like efficiency come into place. So you can spend more time finding work rather than all your time doing project work because you've got systems in place. So um, so finding new work, that's fine. Another way of overcoming that, I think, as architects is that entrepreneurial spirit of, okay, what can I pr- create? What can I um, create into a product? How can 
there be cash flow coming in without me doing anything or much, you know? So the app, it's, it's done. You know, this, we can update it, yes, and we will continue to update it, but it's not something that needs our time all the time, but it's something that just flows in the background. And yes, you need a new person and you have a new relationship and then, yeah, do you want to sponsor the app? Fine. Um, but yeah, being creative in how we organize our cash flow and being creative in how we decide what success looks like for a practice. I think as architects, we're so um, obsessed with the star architects and you're only a real success when you've got these 10 awards accorded to your name. Um, but I think longevity is success. You know, I think that every day um, progress to what you want to achieve is success. So, yeah. you know, from the begin from day one, when I sat down um, in my room before I, sat up, before I had an office, when I sat down in my room and said, I'm going to run practice, that is success because it's, it's a worthy ideal that I see at the end and it's the daily increments to get there. Um, and I think, yeah, success it can, should be redefined for architects in terms of actually how can we make the whole practice successful through product, through any other great idea we have. And what's success for you? <laughs> Good question. Um, success, this is, this is a stolen quote, but success is that, is it's the, um, the daily progression towards a worthy ideal. So there, there is almost no end point because it's as long as I'm moving in the direction I want to move. So growing practice, bringing out new products, um, eventually doing um, Bolade design um, developments, which have high quality. So success will always look different. And in five years, my definition of success will have changed. And actually, that's it. I never want to reach. There's no end. Um, so as long as I have the energy and the ability to keep going, I think that's success. Amazing. Thank you so much <laughs> for your time. And I look forward to, if you would like, to interview you again in a few years' time or Absolutely. maybe next year, just so I can hit, see the development and the growth of all of these ideas come to fruition. That would be amazing. absolutely pleasure talking to you. Thank and you. And you too. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you. <laughs> so that is a wrap. Thank you for listening. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.